Now that's just an event vision. After that, they need proof of that vision. That's when you do a demo. Most companies are doing the demo way too early. They're trying to use the demo to educate when the proper use of the demo is to prove the buying vision. Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Mike Bosworth, I am super pumped, my friend, that uh, you're joining me here today on Selling with Social. I know we met as a direct result of the story of sales. Both of us were inside of the movie that Salesforce.com produced, and it was fantastic to be part of the movie with you. I know all about you best-selling author, Mike Bosworth Leadership, speaker, trainer, entrepreneur. Can we say anything more about you, my friend? Welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here, Mario. And uh, that movie was a blast, although I have to tell you that there was a bunch of footage they didn't use of me that I was really disappointed they didn't use. I don't know if you had the same feeling, but... uh, well, we recorded for what it was, at least a few hours or a couple hours, however long it was. I think it was at least... 60 to 90 minutes. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of recording. Absolutely. I, I think yeah. they're going to make a story of sales part two. But when the movie came out, I said, Jim, Jim Hopkins, a, a friend of ours, of course, I said, Jim, do I get more than 30 seconds in the movie? <laughs> well, I asked Jim if there was some way I could get my hands on all the video they took of me. I'd love to have it. Yeah, that was some good footage. And, and the story of sales uh, was a huge, tremendous success uh, for just really articulating the value of sales and the sales profession and bringing some light to everything from car salesmen through B2B selling, right? And, and as a matter of fact, I um, went up to the University of Minnesota Duluth because I've got a couple of people up there that are big supporters of mine. And they actually, the the business school premiered the movie up there in a really nice old theater. They had about 300 people show up. And after the movie, the questions started coming and they finally had to kick us out of the theater. Uh And what so many young people said is now I'm not afraid to call my mother and tell her I want to go into sales when I graduate. Isn't that a funny thing? What is the stat that I heard? Is it 50% of all jobs or 80% of all jobs or you enter into sales? Some astronomically high 50% number. 50% of all college graduates at some point in their career will have a job as a salesperson. And yet there are so few college programs or degree programs in sales uh, that are out there. I think the number is up to 45 accredited sales programs. Yeah, there's only 200 schools that have more than two courses in sales out of 4,000 colleges and universities. And, you know, you think about it. I said, why aren't these colleges and universities preparing these kids? But then I started to think about how many college business professors could ever make a sales call. (laughs) That's true. That's true. How are they going to teach the kids how to sell if, you know, if they can't sell? Yeah, that's a very good point. There, that's the difference between an academic subject and a skill. And uh, I'm hoping to help the University of Minnesota at Duluth develop some skill classes to teach people how to go out and interview for their dream job, whether it's sales or not. And then if they do go into sales, have a B2B sales. So I'm going I'm to be helping them with some curriculum, which I think is going to be fun. That's awesome. Last year, we chose the uh, University of Texas, Dallas to uh, help participate and provide coaching with social selling. This year, we're actually helping the University of Houston and their sales program with teaching them how to leverage video in cool. outreach and sales prospecting. So, Vangresso, for sure, like one of the things we feel like we want to be part of these sales programs. But I will tell you this. I was very sad. And I went to school at UC Berkeley. 
I reached out to UC Berkeley and they told me that they're not accepting any adjunct professors or outside sales influencers to help in their business sales program. So anybody from UC Berkeley listening in, shame on you. (laughs) Yeah, shame on my alma mater too, Cal Poly Pomona. I've been a speaker at so many colleges and universities, but it took my alma mater over 30 years to uh, have me come out as a speaker. Yeah, I tell you, I tell you. Well, listen, what I want to know is, first off, tell us a little bit about you, Mike. Obviously, everybody who's listening in, sales, sales leaders, marketing leaders, business owners, they know that you were in the story of sales. You were one of 20 sales influencers selected to be part of that particular movie. We know a little bit about yourself as an author, but just give us a little background about you and your business and where you've gone in in terms of your career. I uh, first got exposed to computers in Vietnam. I was there for a year and I ended up uh, running the officer inventory program on an early stage IBM computer. So when I came back from Vietnam at the age of uh, almost 21, with only one year of junior college under my belt, I wrote a letter to IBM and I said, hey, I I ran this IBM system for a year in Vietnam. I want to work for IBM. And they wrote me back and said, Mike, we think you should go to college. And so (laughs) I went to Cal Poly Pomona on the GI Bill. And in 1972, I graduated at the age of 25 and I got an entry level job with the computer services division of Xerox in 1972. That division was started in 1969. And uh, most people know that Xerox has invented more cool technology they never made money at than any company in the history of the world. They invented the whole desktop we're using now, the mouse, the windows, the trash can, the icon, that whole user interface Xerox invented, never made a penny on it, but they did allow Steve Jobs to tour their skunk works and look what he did with it. They invented ethernet, they never made any money off of that, but. Most people don't know that in 1969, Xerox invented software as a service. They invented, in essence, the cloud. When I joined them in 1972, they had 50 Los Angeles city governments, distributors, manufacturers, businesses in the LA area hooked up to our central computer with phone lines and dumb terminals. And it was 25 business applications, general ledger, Accounts payable, accounts receivable, material planning, production control, inventory in real time. So they were posting their transactions, getting answers, and uh, they had to pay for usage. So we charged them for the amount of room their data took in our computer. We charged them for every print line, whether we printed the print line on our high-speed printers at our data center and delivered them the next day or whether they printed them on their dumb terminals. And every carriage return, every enter was 2.2 cents. <laughs> so that meant that I was up employee number 120. All 120 employees were focused on keeping all 50 of those customers with an average of five terminals each. So 250 simultaneous terminals pounding, you know, our computers, keeping them up because if they weren't up, there was no revenue. They hired me because they had a job that was so, excuse me, shitty that none of their more senior people wanted it, which is the help desk. (laughs) So I started on the help desk for a year. Then I went out as a field application provider. You know, I went out and helped convert our new clients from their old way to using our online real-time system, our cloud system. And then they asked me to go into sales in 1975. And I had two answers for him, no and hell no. (laughs) The the no was because all the customers that I'd been taking care of for the past two years, in my opinion, the salespeople sold them some vaporware. They told Mm. them that the system would do things it really wouldn't do. Mm. And so as a service person, I had to go out there and reset the expectation. Mm. So I wasn't holding them in high esteem. And the second problem was my violent alcoholic father was a salesman and he never kept a job longer than six months. And the last thing I ever wanted to do was go into sales. Mm. So long story short, they came back a week later and said, 
we want to reduce your risk and we want you to give it a try. So try sales for six months. You can keep your techie salary. If you sell anything on top of that, gravy. And at the end of six months, in writing, if you hate sales, you can have your old job back. So Good deal. That sounds like a good deal. Yeah, I was 28 years old. The next youngest salesperson in the company was 35. The majority of the salespeople we had hired back then came from IBM because our CEO founder came from IBM. So you Mm -hmm. hire people you know. Yeah. And they weren't really worried about me breaking the bank in that six months, keeping my techie salary, because typically every new salesperson we brought in back then minimum of nine months, usually 13 to 15 months until they made their first sale. Wow. Well, I had a huge advantage that I did not know I had. Of course, yeah. I was doing something intuitively that I've spent the last 40 years trying to codify so I can teach other salespeople. What I didn't know how to do was prospect, to find new prospects. But Once I had a business person, whatever your job title was, accounts payable, cash management, inventory control, material control, payroll benefits, I knew how you used to do your job before you had our system. And I knew how much better you were able to do your job on our online real-time transaction processing system. And I had firsthand stories of helping all those job titles. I did not know it at the time how valuable that was. So my boss, he says, okay, I got to teach you how to cold call. So back then, cold calling was smokestacking. We'd go out into an industrial park and Xerox gave me an industrial guide that ha- where I could pick out all our sweet spot prospects. You know, a manufacturing company that had a minimum of 50 employees, maximum of 250 doing assembly manufacturing. So I knew where they were. I'd walk in, say to the receptionist, my name's Mike Bosworth, I'm with Xerox Computer Services, and I'd like to speak with your materials manager. She'd pick up the phone, call the materials manager, 80% of the time they came out. Mm -hmm. Now that's, my audiences today are blown away by that, right? But back then, those materials managers were 38, I mean, they were 48 to 58 years old. And they've been out of college a long time. And when they were in college, there wasn't much going on with technology as it applied to manufacturing, certainly. And so the only way they could learn anything new about cool new technology was to see the salesperson from IBM or Xerox or Honeywell or Burroughs or whatever. There was no internet. So that caused them to come, you know, pretty high percentage to come out, that curiosity. And the other thing was, is no one ever called on a materials manager. And so they were saying, why some salesmen want to talk to me? So high degree of curiosity, 80% came out. All my peers, the ones that were former IBM salespeople, we put them through six weeks of product training. To graduate, you had to demo the product. I went through the same demo, product demo training before I went on the help desk. But if you think about it, when they went out on a sales call, the only thing our company taught them how to do is demo the product. So they'd meet you for the first time. If they got a materials manager to come out in the lobby, they'd say, hi, uh, can I give you a demo of our new MRP system? Or would you like to see a demo of our system? What I did intuitively was, oh, you're the materials manager? And they'd confirm it. And by the way, when they came out and looked at me, I watched their face drop because I'm a kid. I'm 28 years old. He's 48. Invariably, they'd look at me and they'd look at their watch. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they say, okay, now I have to be polite for the next... 15 minutes until I can blow this guy off and get rid of him, right? Right, right. So I'd confirm there the materials manager, and then I'd say, can I share a quick story with you about another materials manager I've been working with for the last 18 months who's less than a mile from here? Mm. Guess how many of them turned down that story? Zero. Zero. Because I offered, instead of me as a 28-year-old telling him what a cool, hot manufacturing system I have that's going to change his life, I asked him if he was curious 
how another 48-year-old materials manager had already solved the major problem of shortages. So he'd say yes to the offer of the story. I'd tell him a 90-second story, literally, which in that 90-second story, he was able to conclude that even though I'm young, I did understand how hard his job was and that Xerox might have a solution to his biggest problem, which is shortages. So at the end of 90 seconds, I'd say, enough about me. What's going on here? Yeah. So, you, so essentially, you used the power of storytelling. Power of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, to be and able so to. So now he got the message. You know how Challenger Sale talks about insight? Yeah. Well, he got the insight from the story. Exactly. Not from a 28 year old. Well, and the story was his peer, right? His peer. Yeah, his and peer. People are curious about their peers. They're competitive with their peers. Which, by the way, was a mile away. A mi- yeah, a mile away. So invariably, I'd ask him, what's going around here? And he'd say, you want to come in and take a look? And I'd spend the next hour going through his plant, diagnosing everything. And in my first five months in sales, I sold more than anybody had sold in the history of the company in a full year. (laughs) Wow. Congratulations. That's the lesson I'm teaching young salespeople now is you don't have to be with a company two years, but you have to be able to... The beginning of a buy cycle is curiosity. And your marketing department, and I think today we're going to talk about integrating marketing with sales. I think so. If you're a young salesperson, your marketing department, if they want to launch you quickly, they should be telling you exactly where your targeted customers and buyer personas are by title. If you sell to bankers or insurance people or manufacturing people or retail or whatever, and they should be arming you with those peer stories. So you can go out, bond, shake hands with somebody, verify their job title and say, offer that story about a peer. Well, especially powerful is if you're a young salesperson, yeah. Right. And again, inevitably, oftentimes younger, younger salespeople are selling to 35 and older types of buyers. Yeah, so much older. You, yeah. You, you want to be looked at as a peer, but inevitably you're, there's a generational gap. When I started out in sales, I was 19 years old. Some of the people I was selling to, I was the same age as their children. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so there's a level there that you've got to use other people's stories, yep. the use of storytelling to really connect the listener in to where you want them to go if they have that particular business problem. Now then the next part though, and that's what Xerox was pretty good at helping us with once they trust you enough to admit their problem to you and say, come on in, let me show you around. Now the way we get young people credible is we give them discovery questions written by the smartest people in our company on how to diagnose the prospect's wow. problem with the bias towards whatever we sell, our stuff. Yeah. And then teach them to do the diagnosis and say, Mario, let me see if I get you. Let me see if I understand your situation, A, B, C, D, E. Did I get that right? And once the guys say, yeah, you got it, then we teach him to say, can I try a couple of ideas on you? And now we pose vision questions. Yeah. You told me about how you were going to go to your son's soccer game on Friday and a major vendor called, canceled the shipment you were expecting the following Monday and ruined your weekend. What if the next time that happens, you could do an inquiry onto your desktop terminal and get a list of the customers that were going to be affected by that cancellation in less than five minutes and go to see your kid's soccer game. So we'd put them in a situation where they could handle that situation much better with ours than with the way he was doing it. And so I sold that way from the very beginning, Mario. And then that's how, what solution selling was. Solution selling was teaching people to get your marketing department to arm you with the knowledge of the buyer personas, 
what problems are they likely to have that our product would help them solve, and teach them the product as a verb. I'll teach them the product as the customer uses it to solve problems rather than teaching them the product as a noun. It does this, it does this, it features this, it features that. The product training is huge. And again, that's part of the uh, integration between marketing and sales because most product training is done by product marketing. Yeah. You know, interesting, you, know, you mentioned a couple times, marketing should be providing these types of things to you from a sales perspective. But oftentimes, that's not what's happening, right? And oftentimes, a sales organization has taught a, a certain type of curriculum in their onboarding process. And it is, uh, you know, here's what our product does. Here's what our features and functions. I think there's some validity, though, here when you talk about the whole sales and marketing alignment that there's got to be some way that the chief sales officer or the head of sales, whoever it might be, and the head of marketing, the CMO, are working together to get the maximum results that they want out of the salespeople. Absolutely. So the question then becomes is, is what should they agree on to be able to maximize those results? Well, I've got a little list here, and uh, let me right. take you through it. I'm ready for your list. All right. And so are the by list. the way, you know, people are always talking about integration of sales and marketing. That word integration actually is problematic because when most people think integration, they think IT. They think getting one application to talk to another application. Sure. And I mean, I, I've run into companies who are trying to use technology in such a way that the VP of sales and the VP of marketing never have to have another conversation again. The technology will just, you know, do the interface for them. What, what I coach my clients, I say, let's remove the word integration and substitute the word agreement. So, and, then, and that's exactly the word you were using, agreement. So first thing they should agree on, the CMO and the CSO, are who the targeted buyers are by persona by job title, where we can define their world before our product and after our product. The next thing would be customer usage marketing. Now, this is probably the toughest thing for product marketing because most product marketing departments talk about the product as an it. So when they bring a bunch of new salespeople into a room and they're going to teach them about the product, it does this and it does that. They're not teaching the customers how they use the product. They're teaching the product as a noun, not a verb. And one of the reasons is, and this is sad, but I don't even want to know the number of product marketing people in the IT industry that admit to me they've never talked to a customer. In other <laughs> words, their whole source of power in their company is their knowledge of the product mm. as a noun, not their knowledge of how specific potential buyers use our product right. situationally to make money, save money, achieve a goal, solve a problem. And that's why startup times for salespeople are so long. Product marketing teaches them the product as a noun, and now the salespeople have to go out and learn the solutions by buyer persona. It usually takes them 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So the startups are really long, and it could be shrunk dramatically if we could get product marketing to change to customer usage marketing. And, and I'll, let me translate that, th this number two here. I get the targeted buyer persona by title, by type. That totally makes sense. And I mean, gosh, you would hopefully think that sales and marketing leaders know that, especially those that are listening in. But the customer usage marketing is how a customer is utilizing the platform and understand what benefits the customer is gleaning from that so that you can then turn around and translate that into stories. Yes, Pure to stories. Other, other buyers, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's self generating. So yeah. it's not an easy transition, but especially today where 
everything, so much of what businesses are buying are cloud-based, their yeah. subscription, their yeah. usage. They're not buying a piece of hardware anymore. They're buying usage, which means yeah. that the salespeople today don't have the product to demo anyway. The cloud is forcing today's salespeople to understand how targeted buyer personas do their job without their product and how they would do their job with their product. Interestingly enough, today, as a matter of fact, I had a call with the head of marketing and the head of uh, digital transformation for a company with 48,000 employees. So a fairly large size organization. And majority of the conversation, it was a 45 minute long call. And majority, when I say majority, at least 60% of that conversation was spent on how are other customers using these platforms? Yeah. <laughs> what are the, some of the gotchas and the, and the oh craps and the, oh, I didn't realize uh, that this would be an outcome. They wanted to know that from other customers. Fortunately for us, we had you know, many customers that we could pull yeah. from that we could yeah. speak to that. That just goes to show that this conversation was centered around all about customer usage marketing how are other customers utilizing the yes. platform and what benefits they're receiving uh, from that? Yep. Um, the next agreement are the stages of the buy cycle, not the sell cycle. So many CSOs, if you look at their uh, pipeline milestones on Salesforce, it's we did a survey, we did a demo, we did an ROI, we did this, we did that. Instead of going through the stages of how people buy. And, and you and I talked earlier about the first stage of a buy cycle where they go from not looking, but should be looking at you, but they're not. In other words, most of my clients tell me there's a ton of people out there in their targeted defined market who should be looking at them, but they're not. And there's two reasons why they're not looking. Either ignorance, they don't know that you've invented a better way or rationalization. They tried to solve that problem once, they failed, and human beings, when they conclude they don't have control over a problem, they push it in the back of their brain and try and just press on, right? Because as humans, we don't like keeping problems in our foreground brain that we don't know how to solve. So right. we, we push them back. Um, so if we're gonna have marketing help sales, marketing, they should be initiating buy cycles. They should be initiating curiosity. And the first step of a buy cycle is curiosity, which is why I'd ask a materials manager, can I tell you a quick story about one of your peers? When they said yes, now he's given me 90 seconds. So now I go from 10 seconds to 90 seconds. At the end of 90 seconds, if he trusts me enough to admit a problem, he'll now give me an hour. But it's incremental. And marketing can be doing that one to many. Salespeople are doing it one on one. But so, as an example, because I think there's, I've never really thought through this here. So, this is the first time I'm thinking through this here, Mike. But if I were to think about the sales process, and in most cases, even our own CRM, it's, it's constructed around uh, the stages of the selling cycle. Did you do a proposal or did you do a, a benchmark survey? Did you yeah. do a proposal? Then have you moved into, you know, contract negotiation? Have you moved right. into a verbal, right? Are you legal, you know, doing legal negotiation? Like, like all these different steps, right? So that makes sense. But, but I think there's a direct correlation to uh, customer buying triggers that would move you from, as an example, demo to, yes, I want a contract and then contract to, yes, I want to send this to legal to review. And that's where you're saying is, is that we should be defining what that buy cycle looks like, not necessarily the sell cycle. Because in some cases, just because we're moving from, as an example, let me and tell me if I'm wrong here, just because we're moving from, yes, I want a proposal from you, does not mean that I'm still going to buy from you. Exactly. Uh, so you're looking for the customer's buying signals and mapping to that, and then the sales trigger events will correspond accordingly. Yeah. Um, if your uh, listeners would like, if they contact me, I've got a set of buyer-oriented, bicycle-oriented pipeline milestones that my customers are putting into their Salesforce systems, and they're converting and trying to tr help people buy. 
Can we just put that as a link? Uh, is there, is it a downloadable asset or do they have to email you? Um, I could save it as a PDF. Could you put it up as a downloadable asset? I, sure, I'm well, not very good at technology. Sure. But. Yeah, yeah. If you send it on over for everybody listening in, we'll add that to the show notes here. There'll be a downloadable asset that you can download, which is a, a multimedia file. Good. And when you look at it, you'll see at these different stages, PDT. And PDT means public display of trust. <laughs> okay. By your buyer. I've got a bicycle here in front of me. So can I just walk you through a few yeah. steps of a, now th this is generic, but they go from not looking to first step, pure curiosity, 10 seconds. Then at the end of the 90 seconds story, this seller gets me. That's the next step after curiosity. The next step after that in a bicycle is hope for a solution to a problem that I haven't figured out how to solve yet. Next step would be peer envy because now they realize their peers have already solved that problem. They haven't. Peer envy is a huge motivator in a bicycle. Next step is willing to be tended. They're willing to really open up their kimono and let you come in and do the detail survey, do the requirements analysis, do the ROI, run all the numbers. They trust you enough and they're far enough along they're willing to let you do that. That's a public display of trust. Then they have a buying vision. A buying vision is now they've got mapped out at an event level what they will be able to do differently if they had your product. Now that's just an event vision. After that, they need proof of that vision. That's when you do a demo. Most companies are doing the demo way too early. They're trying to use the demo to educate when the proper use of the demo is to prove the buying vision. And I've had so many clients over the years say their demos go from eight hours to 45 minutes because we're now only demoing the things the buyer said they need to solve their problem. We took the time to get the buyer to that level of understanding. Then we take our product out and the proof is pretty easy. Once our buyer has the proof, now they're gonna to wanna to share it with other people in their committee. And at that point, now we have to go through the authority. Do we have somebody interested who's got the authority to change? We have to help them calculate their ROI. We have to help them see if it fits within a budget or if they can move money and, and then their timing. But the traditional stuff of budget, authority, timing, ROI are further down. And if we take the time to understand, to create some peer envy and process their needs and create those buying visions, those usage, those product usage visions first, before we take our product out, the transformation's amazing. So anyway. So do you think this is why, one of the reasons why sellers end up hitting a slump, if you would? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I think the number one reason for just poor sales performance in general is the seller, seller's sell cycle is really out of sync with the buyer's buy cycle. Mm -hmm. But a slump, you can't have a slump unless at one point you were at a high level of performance. True, yeah. Right. If you're a new salesperson, you're, you can't be in a slump if you've never performed. So by definition, a slump means you were hitting it and now you're not. Just like a, a baseball player, right? They're in a hitting slump. But the slump, Neil Rackham helped me understand the slump because slumps are predictable by salespeople. And what Neil Rackham discovered when he first started studying the Xerox Salesforce in 1979 for the SPIN project, and Neil was on the movie with us too for everybody. Yeah, he was, yep. He discovered that Xerox had hired these bright kids out of college, put them through six weeks of product training, push them out in the field, and they get better, 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 better every month for 18 months. But at 18 months, their performance peaked, took a drop, and they were in a slump. You could set your watch by each new class of kids. They'd hit that slump. And what Neil Rackham discovered is that it took them 18 months to become solution experts. 
It took them 18 months because all their product training taught them was how to demo the product. It took them 18 months to learn how controllers use their products and how purchasing departments use their products and how order processing departments use their products. That solution expertise by persona, they forced all their salespeople to learn it on their own. So what happens is now, the first day of the 19th month, now our new salesperson is an expert at knowing the precise Xerox solution to a finite set of buyer persona problems. Yeah. And so they, they meet a prospect on the first day of the 19th month. The prospect gets four words out of his mouth about his problem. And what does the seller do? Immediately goes to the solution. Yeah. Oh, we see that all the time. This Let me is tell you a story. Life. Here's what you need. And most human beings hate being told what they need. Right. And we do a little exercise in our workshops. I say, if you doubt me on this, I say, how many of you in the room are in a long-term romantic relationship, marriage or partnership? And, you know, probably 80% of the people raise their hands. I say, on the next break, call your partner on your mobile device. Yeah. Get him or her on the phone and try two to three you need to's in, inside of 30 seconds and see how well they fly. <laughs> Not very well. That's the slump. So the slump comes when the seller becomes such an expert that they get impatient. We call it premature elaboration. <laughs> they, 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 they see the problem and they're on it like a junkyard dog telling people what they need. The yeah. irony is they're correct, but the buyers start pushing them away and don't want to buy from them. That's the reason for most slumps. Yeah. And so the was, solution to that is a pure story. I was uh, with Sherry Levitin, also a best-selling author, sales yeah. influencer. Oh, also in the movie with us as well. Right. She's in the movie too. Yeah. And uh, she calls it the premature demonstration syndrome. <laughs> well, I, well, I think we're kindred spirits on that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the, the salespeople see the solution faster than the buyer because now they're solution experts. It took them 18 months to become a solution expert. Yeah. But once you're a solution expert, that's the reason you fall into a slump. Yeah. So breaking out of it, then what do you do? Well, it's funny because uh, a couple of years ago, we were doing an open workshop and we had this salesman, Jeff, who worked for an SEO search engine optimization company. This was in March of whatever year it was. The previous year, Jeff was the number one salesperson in their company. He he nailed it. He was the president of their park club or whatever the previous year. Here we now are in March. He hasn't sold a thing in this year. He's in a huge slump. slump. Yeah. And I told the Neil Rackham story and the solution expert story. And he did a, right in the class. He did like a Homer Simpson. He went, do oh. he hit himself in the head because he knew that's what he'd been doing because he's such an expert. And the day after the workshop ended, he had three video calls like this. Yeah. And in all three cases, he was talking to CMOs. They'd admit their problem and he'd start to tell them what the solution was. And then he'd catch himself and he almost bit his tongue off, he said. It was so hard to stop himself from telling what they needed. Instead, he said, can I share a story with you about another CMO of another multi-location retailer we've been working with? Yeah. Yeah. They said yes to the story. He made all three sales. He was out of his slump within 48 hours of the workshop because it was a behavioral problem. He was yeah. too much of an expert. And most slumps are coming from expertise. Neil Rackham said, your expertise plus your enthusiasm become your enemy. Mm. By the way, uh, Neil uh, Rackham is the author of Spin Selling. And he was in the movie with us too. <laughs> yeah, he was, boy, we're, we're taking everybody. We just need to add on Jill Conrath and, and well, Mark Roberge. And <laughs> it's, it, it's fun hanging out with, with kindred spirits who all really are, I, I will call us all sales philosophers. That's true. But I think all of us have not just the philosophy, but actually been in the seat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, back to the list of, inter, of agreements. Uh, agreement on the stages of the customer buy cycle, agreements on our use of technology. And here's the big one. 
the one that can make the biggest difference, at least so far in, in my experience, is mutually agreeing on the definition of a qualified lead. Because if you think about it, most sales vice presidents will tell you right. the leads we're getting from marketing are crap. They wouldn't know a prospect if it bit them in the butt. Right. And the VP of marketing is, will tell me we're sending all these hot leads to sales and they fall into a black hole and we never get any, uh, we never get to close the loop on them. Right. So how about this for a definition of a qualified lead? Let me hear it. A defined buyer persona, a materials manager, is curious how we helped one of their peers solve a problem, achieve a goal through the use of our product. Well, that's not a like salesman a in the world who wasn't going to take that as a lead. That would seem like a hot lead to me. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's integration because the lead is typically the day-to-day -day touch point between sales and marketing. Yeah. So agreement on the definition of a qualified lead and agreement on let's facilitate the customer's buying experience rather than ramming our sales cycle down their throat. What do you mean by that? That means facilitating the buy cycle instead of pushing our sales cycle. And you, you know, how many sales courses over the years have you been exposed to Mario where they had a module on closing? Yeah, every one of them. Well, if you think about it, the very best salespeople, the top 20%, rarely have to close. Yeah, exactly right. Because they're so good at intuitively facilitating the buyer's buy cycle that the buyer will even say, so what do I have to do next to get this thing? The buyer will close themselves yeah. if the seller is patient and understands how to facilitate the buy cycle. So that's what I mean. If we can agree as a company that our customer's experience is going to be a differentiator for us, that we are going to facilitate our customer's natural buy cycle to where they don't ever think we're high pressuring them and we're trying to grind them into closing early so we can make our quarter and, you know, throwing discounts out when we shouldn't be. All that bad behavior that happens at quarter end which to me, I just don't get why software companies are so focused on doing end of quarter specials and discounting and end of year just to make the number. If you just did it all year long and priced it the way you should have priced it to begin with, all mm -hmm. year long, you would close all year long. You'd be steady. Yeah, and if marketing were out there priming the pump handing sales people who are curious how their peers have solved problems and the salespeople had the patience to gain the credibility to get the buyer to admit their pain, to tend their story, to create a buying vision, to then prove it, you know, to, per the uh, pipeline milestones, I will uh, send you so we can offer it to people because that's a great idea. And, and it really makes it a more honorable profession too, when you don't have to high pressure close, but you know, most, most sales bad behaviors because their management is forcing those salespeople out of fear and intimidation to behave badly. That or I've heard that I've been with public companies almost all my career, but it's what you have to tell to the market, right? And it's the market that is demanding you hit your numbers and you hit these numbers. But yeah, Wall like, Street. Yeah. Wall Street. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is that to your point, and I'm thinking about the last five deals that I just recently did, there was no close to the deals. Yeah. There, was, there was no close other than, okay, how do we get started? That was the right. next question. I answered that question. And then my question is, is do I understand correctly that you want to get started still at this particular time? Because if so, let's work backwards now and right. make sure we're on the same page to get legal, this, that, and the other. Yeah. The answer is, yes, that's still the time frame, But well, then you had to listen to the butt and you push out. Okay, well, that might actually prolong us or, you know, we're going to smash this in and get this done and over with, right? Right. There's a difference between qualifying their need and desire for your product. And once that we call that a buying vision, but now we need a transition vision. Okay, now I want it. What has to happen for my company to acquire it? 
Yeah. The legal, the technical, the approvals, the purchasing, the approved vendor list. So we, we talk about qualifying the need versus qualifying the budget authority timing, the whole buying process that the organization goes through. But so many salespeople are out there out of sync. They're saying, well, Mario, what's your budget for a solution like this when they've never processed the need? Budget yeah. for what? Right. Their sell cycle is out of whack with the way people buy. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Mike, uh, with, we only have a few minutes left here, but I have a couple questions for you. Okay. And uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, for those of you listening in, I really love, and I, I wrote down six points that you came up with here uh, in terms of uh, some of the items you were just mentioning on uh, for a CSO and a CMO to maximize result. Oh, the ones that hit home for me was the customer usage marketing. Really yep. understand how your true live customers are utilizing your technology, your service, your platform, and the benefits by which you're they're receiving the results and yeah. the, the results and then turn that into a story yes that you can use and that is one of the, the missing elements like that uh, people are oftentimes missing from the selling process if you would or the buying process if, if, if as, a, as a better statement um the customer <clears throat> the term customer usage marketing kind of is, seems boring to most of our clients and so we're starting to relabel it customer hero marketing Customer here. Are our customers becoming heroes in their own organizations using our stuff? Yeah, great point. Do me a favor, Mike. If someone wants to get a hold of you, is it through LinkedIn, through Twitter? What, what's the I'm best on way LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter, I've never been much on Twitter. Maybe, I, you know, I, I, I don't have a buying vision for Twitter yet for myself. All right, so reach out to you via LinkedIn. LinkedIn, and or uh, I've got a Mike Bosworth Leadership Facebook page out there. And if you just want to send me an email, Mike Bosworth, I've got a website, MikeBosworth.com, that um, gets into more details about what I do. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, Mike, do me a favor. One last question, one final question, and that is your all-time favorite movie. What is it? I'm struggling with that because both of them were when I was 19 years old and I was in the Army and I was depressed as all get out. Yeah, I'm 19 years old. My mother died when I was 18, and my siblings got sent to relatives, and my father split and left, and I'm, you know, pretty emotionally not in a great place. And the two movies that knocked me out as a 19-year-old were The Summer of 42 <laughs> and Dr. Shivago. And both of those movies, I cried, and I didn't even cry at my mother's funeral. Hmm. <laughs> So those two movies, I still remember they elicited, they were almost like therapy for me that caused me to just really get in touch with my grief and, and cry. And I'm sure there's been other movies over the years that I've enjoyed more, but those two, you know, they had the biggest emotional impact on me. Fantastic. Mike, it was a pleasure having you on Selling With Social. I want to thank you, my friend, for being here. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. 